Welcome back uh, to our next session. I'm honored to welcome on the panel Dr. Peter March, Executive Dean of the School of Art and Science, Rutgers University. Good morning, everyone. Um, and welcome, if, if only uh, virtually, to, to Rutgers. Um, very pleased that you're all able to make it here. And uh, we're, we're really very excited to be hosting, even if only in this remote way, uh, this Mo MOCO conference. Um, you know, I'm a Dean of Arts and Sciences. I'm, I'm personally committed to, to the relationship and the mutual leveraging of, of arts and sciences, but, you know, it's difficult to do uh, and often results in, in art about science or, or the science of producing art. Um, I'm a mathematician. Think, think about the theory of perspective. There you are. So we're um, delighted, though, that this conference and uh, this organization in particular is, is uh, all about employing computing as a, a new liaison uh, between art and science and movement in this case. Uh, and um, pretty inspired by it and very glad to be part of it uh, and, and in welcoming you today. So I'm delighted to note that there are um, participants from uh, Europe, from South America, from Australia, pretty much all time zones. Uh, I want to welcome you in particular, those of you whose uh, day is inverted uh, and you are made really a, a special efforts to uh, organize your time to meet with us here where it's 11 a.m. in New Jersey. Um, we recognize that there are huge challenges in, in fulfilling the, the, the vision of MOCO and particularly in this time of COVID where um, our movement is restricted in a very ironic way. Uh, but we're really thrilled that uh, Rutgers can be a part of this, and in particular, the School of Arts and Sciences. We're just delighted to be hosting and doing what we can to help uh, ensure um, the vision here and uh, writ large, but also this uh, conference in particular is a success. So welcome. Um, very glad you're here. I really wish you a good conference, and uh, thanks very much for allowing me to be part of it. Good luck, everybody. Thank you very much for joining us. So next, we have the keynote of distinguished professor Dimitris Metaxas. Dr. Dimitris Metaxas is a distinguished professor in the Department of Computer Science at Rutgers University and a director of the Center for Computational Biomedicine, Imaging and Modeling, CBIM. Before joining the Rutgers, he was a tenured associate professor in the Computer and Information Science Department of the University of Pennsylvania and director of director of the VAST lab. Dr. Metaxas conducts research towards the development of formal methods upon which computer vision, computer graphics, and medical imaging can advance synergistically. In computer vision, he works on the simultaneous segmentation and fitting of a complex objects, say presentation, statistical model-based tracking, learning, sparsity, and gesture recognition. In particular, he is focused, focusing on uh, human body and safe motion analysis, human surveillance, security application, applications, ASL recognition, behavior modeling, and analysis and scalable solutions to large and distributed sensor-based networks. He has published a book on his research activities titled uh, Physics-Based deformable models, applications to computer vision, graphics, and medical imaging. Finally, Dr. Metaxas has received seven patents and numerous best paper awards on his work on vision, medical imaging, and fluid modeling. Dr. Metaxas has awarded a Fulbright Fellowship and was a recipient of the NSF Research Initiation and Career Awards, among other distinctions. Please welcome Dr. Metaxas. Well, Wilhelmini, thank you very much for your words and I'm very honored, of course, to give a, a talk at uh, your conference. So let me share my screen now. Um, so today I'm going to talk to you about, uh, about the latest, uh, if you want, or the new direction we're following due to 
uh, machine learning methods so that not only we can do robust and scalable uh, human behavior analytics, but also explainable. Basically, a notorious problem of machine learning is that they don't explain to you what's happening. So now we're trying to create methods that explain. So I'm going to show you um, several of the methods and applications and in human uh, movement uh, analytics. And of course, they're not only applicable to these applications, they're uh, general purpose methods. So um, as Vilmay said, I'm directing, I came from Penn around 2002 to, to give you the opportunity to have a center um, and grow in these areas. And especially in medical applications, imaging, news, computer vision, and analytics like the ones I'm talking about, and modeling, meaning also generation of images, which I'll show you a little bit, which are nothing to do with uh, are necessarily about uh, faces and bodies, but they are also applicable there. These are called the, the so-called GAN methods. So the Center for Computation by Medicine and Imaging Modeling has a lot of uh, faculty members, including Elizabeth uh, Torres, and uh, a lot of PhD students, and we have a space of 11,000 square feet, as you see here below and many collaborations with industry and of course academic institutions. And the goal of course is excellence in uh, research and uh, translational uh, research as well. So let me start a little bit about interpretable uh, learning based models for visual recognition. So what do I mean by this? Let's start with the uh, facial behavior. Faces, uh, I, I pick uh, faces to show you first because Faces are so important, right? It, it's the main main uh, way of uh, communicating non-verbally. And there's a lot of, of course, uh, affordances like uh, deafness, uh, where you know people can only do, do it uh, non-verbally. And I pioneered since the early 90s the 3D analysis of faces to recognize sign language. So. Let me give you an example because the military and other, you know, NSF, of course, they're interested, especially nonverbal communication analytics, and of course, related deception and other things. So, we have a lot of funding in a consortium with us, UCSD, Stanford, and Dartmouth. And our goal is to combine face tracking, head gesture detection, and expression recognition towards telling in a game, like the mafia game, who's the, the villager, who's the spy, and which means who is related to deception and who's not. And of course, this is a, a real game, which means a lot of people, like a, like a spy in this, uh, in this game, uh, or, a villa, or if you, uh, the, the spy is, is, is often associated with deception, but not only. Sometimes they're not deceptive, they're not deceitful. But a villager can be deceitful also. So the question is, can you determine if you devise a method where in an unsupervised way, which, or semi-supervised, where somebody tells you in this video, somebody's uh, lying. Can you tell me why? Okay, but to do that, the first thing is you want to analyze the video. So how is this game played, right? So they are in a circle here. And there's a camera looking at the face and they're all synchronized. And um, you also have an overhead uh, 360 view, but we don't use that. So we would like to know from facial expressions, what it means to be deceitful. And we collaborate with a psychologist from the University of Arizona because they have been looking at people and they have theories. The question is, I mean, the big problem is that humans are good at telling things, but they cannot explain things. So can you quantitate in this game what it means to be deceitful or not, or not? So the first thing, of course, is to analyze faces, right? So as you know, the face is 3D. We do have mentally 3D models of face of bodies, even though we see things in 2D. And the reason is, it's very important because you know rotations, etc., should not be confused due to perspective projection with movement of the eyebrows, for example. So the analysis has to be. And what do you need to uh, 
estimate the three rotation or all pitch and yaw as you see here, together with moving back, forward, backwards, and the expressors. So um, let me show you here some. So we have a system that we cannot extract, you know, rotations, translations, but also deformations. Okay. So 68 facial key points, which are very important. And we published many, many publications, uh, of course, in the 90s, but then as the methods improve, we keep publishing. Um, so so in the difficult times, everybody has different face, even though everybody is a face, has a face. Um, but there are differences. So you need a method that can deal with all these variations. And everybody smiles differently. Even though everybody smiles, the smiles are not the same. So the statistics. Obviously, that you know, you need a statistical method, um, and of course, you we have the number, uh, the cameras that look at every face, so we know who's talking or who's uh, doing expressions, etc. So this is the layout, right? So there are seven cameras here, and we analyze every face. Um, we do know who's a spy, who's a villager. What we want to know what it means deception. Okay, so these are examples of a spy, of course, analyzed. Uh, you'll be surprised how very, very, what variations there are among people. And, and humans, if you tell them again, if you didn't know um, who's deceitful, who's not deceitful, they don't do better than 56%. By computer, we can do better now uh, because we can learn statistics, okay? So it's very subtle. I mean, what people do also, they do semantics, like what they're saying, right? I'm talking about the nonverbal. Can I tell you from expressions what it means? I'll show you a little bit the theory of what psychologists think is deception. Okay? So these are spy examples that I showed you, and these are villager examples. So um, what is the video, right? So we have video level, uh, zero is a villager, one is a spy, that's how it's called it. Uh, all the players roll over the whole video and the valuable data hides, of course, a large amount of noise. So people most, most of the time do nothing. And then all of a sudden they say something. Um, so most of the time, this is difficult, right? Spies and villagers have the same behavior. They don't necessarily want to deceive or to lie or to, fool somebody, right? And then, uh, so, and labeling, of course, as you know, if you've worked on video, is that it's very difficult, very time consuming. So that's why you want methods that you don't require so much annotation. So we're trying to answer the following three questions. How to perform video level spy villager classification? Where is the spying in the villager behavior in the video? That's understandability, right? And how do you characterize this behavior in terms of features? So what does it mean, right? So where is it in the video? And even though nobody has told us where it is. Um, the group uh, of psychologists now, uh, we've gone like close to 70%, as I explained to you. Now they are trying to annotate so that they tell us exactly in this period there is deception. So that, of course, the network doesn't learn. So because the video, uh, you cannot do it per frame. So what you do is you, you, what you have to do is you have to analyze bat, bat, you know, bat, batches of frames. So it's called a 3D convolution on your net. Why? Because you take this as a volume. You concatenate the slides, the slices uh, or the frames and you put them all together. So it becomes a volume, right? So you need three, uh, 3D convolutions initially. Um, so basically you have to extend a two-dimensional to a three-dimensional convolution network. And so this is the idea, right? Most neural nets are 2D, now we're doing 3D. And, and of course, with the moment you start doing these things, you need more memory, you know, it takes more time to do all this. Um, so the convolution architecture we tried now, we Got of course much better machines, so you can do much much better uh, and much faster 
all this process. Uh, basically, you can train hours and hours of video in a few days as opposed to two weeks. So you do, this gives you details about number of evolution, max pooling, etc. So this is ways basically that a neural net, what it does is blows the parameters using convolutions to a high dimensional space, then pulls them together and does that many times. And by doing so, it learns parameters. Now, one something to, to, to realize with your next is you're not going to learn is the parameters that extracts are not human understandable. These are correlations between pixels, etc. You need other processes. There's a lot of research in machine learning to convert those to human explainable representations. So it's not the same. But it doesn't matter because the, what they did is they found a way to parameterize the space, not in a human. And, and you know, as things go by in, uh, over the years, you're going to see more and more trust in them and not understanding the parameters, except that there will be methods where you can convert these parameters to representations by humans. And we're trying to do something like this here. So, of course, you, you want to train, right? So there are 14 uh, player videos, including 18 spies, 25 villagers. Spies are related to deception, trying to fool, to fool the villagers. The villagers are more honest. Again, they change roles, and that's the difficulty. So in a video of a spy, sometimes they're deceiving, sometimes they're not deceiving. So, and the total length, as you see, is uh, 45 minutes and uh, you apply the face tracker and then based on the face tracker you input that so you crop the face basically and then you put that in the neural net to recognize so um we are, so the way you train something to tell you about training so you randomly uh, select videos from one or two gamers validation data and the rest for training so you're not allowed of course to test on what you train, because then you're overfitting. So there's no duplicate play appearing in both training and validation. And uh, the round three videos are segmented according to fine grain time steps. So um, during a training, the video we randomly sample 16 frames as the input to the three dimensional video. The reason why we can do more is memory. But these days we can do a lot more because we just got some you know, computers. So in uh, classification accuracy, uh, validation in one and training in five uh, is 65.75 or 62 is the best to date still. Um, we've then, um, so what it says is humans are 70%, but with this initial method we'll get there and then we can do much better. Um, so, Without training a lot of data, it's pretty good what we could do. So it shows you that the neural net can match humans, at least. Uh, now, 70% are humans who know what's deception. On. If you take a random person, they cannot. Um, so um, also, would, uh, so the, the, the idea here is to improve from 65 to go higher we cannot use it as a black box, as a just input output, right? So we're trying to discover spatial and temporal information which is essential for the network to make predictions and then validate the results with respect to what's known from psychologists. So it's uh, actually, it's, not, it's a branch of psychology called communications, communication experts. Like we used to have in the sky here, a lot of people, but then they left. Uh, the big groups in the University of Arizona uh, that have been collaborating for 30 years now. So we compute this uh, class related attention maps. So I'll show you exactly what, uh, what it means. So what you do is you take the output with respect to the parameters, the gradient of the output with respect to the parameters, somewhere in the, in the layers close to the output. So you can see the influence of parameters to the output. That's, that's what attention is about. And in the process, you can find the pixels that influence the most the decision of the network. So that's the idea here is that you, the, let's say the, the network sees uh, a video and then makes a decision 
in this uh, this frame the spine in this frame there's no spine uh, so what you do is do back propagation with respect to the parameters at a layer very close to the alpha like two three layers because the way the networks work towards the end the features they produce are close to a face in the beginning is random things that don't make any sense we want to make something explainable right so if you do that then what happens is uh what is the model learning basically we ask this question right so we can observe that the c3d the network basically starts by focusing on appearance in the first few frames and track salient motion in subsequent. Okay, so in the following example, it first focus on the eyes. So you see here, these are these are the maps, the attention maps by taking these gradients, uh, and then tracks uh, the motion uh, variance happening around. So basically, it tracks multiple frames. So it starts with one frame, then looks at the changes with the uh, neighboring frames. So we can then with these methods, find which frames are most important for the decision and what's in the frame. Okay. Now, uh, of course, uh, so basically to test, we break the video in various clips. The short clips are forwarded to the model and clips with uh, high spy probability can be reserved for deep investigation using these methods and then compare what the model attempts to with the latest deception uh, research uh, to predict what's happening in the face, right? So, and of course the assumption is that spies are more deceived than villagers because that's what they're told, that's how the game is played. Okay. Now, what is known about, okay? So uh, the way humans, uh, you know, happened when I was attempting to know Paul Ekman himself. I visited him and I analyzed his videos of uh, emotion back in 94. 95. So, of course, he invented this method of action units, even though they are not good for computers, meaning they are, they are deficient because they are for humans, means they don't have derivatives, they don't have velocities. Uh, it's more static with some, with, uh, I would say, more qualitative measures of the intensity of an action unit. So, I have a lot of experience, of course, but since then, we've gone beyond action units. But actually, you need something that humans can understand. So, for example, what is uh, in the deception theory? So, there are some action units that are important more blinks, so action unit 45, with emotional responding and masking, and fewer blinks, with cognitive loaded response and efforts at neutralization, sneering, so units 9 and 10, while uh, feigning sadness, leap adapters are important. And sources for the above come from various articles, you know, this is from psychologists, com communication experts. All these are people I've uh, I know or collaborated with somehow. Um, let me give you an example here. So these are the important units uh, related deceptions. This is what's known. So my question is, can my network find those, at least, uh, you know, confirm that they exist? So action unit 45, I told you, blinks. So this is the muscles there. Um, sneering, um, nose wrinkle, upper to razor. So all these you are supposed to identify through the network. Lip adapter, fake happiness. Um, so just the mouth, right? Not around the eyes. It's the, the do send smile versus not do send smile, right? So, and why why is this happening? Because you are thinking when you are deceiving. Therefore, things are getting slower. I mean, there's another study I've done in the past about um, synchrony. So when you having a dialogue, the synchronization between people gets broken when, you, when I'm trying one is trying to deceive the other. In terms of milliseconds, but you can find out because you're, this is research that I used to do like 20 years ago, and it's very important for the military during, uh, of course, interrogations or criminals, because that's how they can start saying, detecting that they are somebody lying. So lying means thinking. If you're truthful, you don't think. Therefore, a lot of different things happen. Of course, you smile fakely, etc. Unless you're super trained like spies, in which case it's more difficult. But it's hard to get this kind of data. 
But the way they interrogate this, so you know, is there are two people. One is hiding behind a glass. Uh, I don't know if you've seen those. Well, probably you wouldn't know and you wouldn't guess. You, all, all you see in TV is somebody is interrogating somebody. What you don't know is they're wearing uh, earplugs. There's somebody hidden and they communicate the interrogators. So they can push them in certain uh, questions, etc. So it's an art, but we're trying to quantify it. Okay? So, um, so what happens? So deception cues versus moral attention. So it looks like the network is finding what seems to be not about deception. So when we analyze, we did find the 45, the blinks here in the, in the frames. We did find the lip stretcher and cheek puffery. Remember, people are different. I mean, what's known doesn't mean everybody is gonna follow exactly, right? But you should, but if somebody is truly lying, they should do something like that. And then actually you're in 24. So if you see here, they exist, okay? So of course, this is what's known. What we hope is we could discover probably people doing differently because another thing you should know is we do studies about culture. Uh, how you express things is masked a lot with culture. Like Asian cultures are more subdued. Uh, you know, Southern Europeans are more expressive, Northern Europeans are less expressive. But, but that's again stereotypes. There are of course, you know, within this group exceptions. Everybody's human, so of course they, they feel the same emotions, but the culture a little bit modulates, okay? So that's why computer is good, because you can quantitate this. Even if the intensity is not the same, there has to be the same kind of muscles because we're all humans. So um, uh, another one, uh, eyes closed, fake smiles, change in lips, these are examples. So here's some uh, examples that fall into a spy category, but uh, are more subtle, okay? So not everybody, as we said, is the same, but we can find those. Um, how about deception versus all attention? So villager frames uh, with the attention marks, right? So the villager is less deceitful, right? So in the special domain, the, the model attends to the facial parts as the eyes, nose, and mouth. But in the temporal domain, there's no sharp intensity changes comparing, uh, compared to the attention maps of spice. That's what we found. Uh, again, you look at the eyes, the mouth, the nose, and the changes. And, uh, and so basically, we have, we're at the beginning now, and we're pushing the envelope towards uh, understanding what is deception, what it is. Because now with this new method, you can do that. Before we used to do things like that with traditional methods, like either Markov models, conditional random fields. But now we are trying to do the neural nets because this, the problem is non linear. So neural nets are much better than this. But you have to use attention methods, et cetera, to explain. And uh, recently we're developing in latent space, like in the space of the neural net to understand what's happening. So there's a lot of research and a lot of new things are gonna happen, I think, in the next few years. Um, so how about uh, learning how to learn? That's another, if, I, if I'm pretending I'm understanding what the face is doing, how about if I can generate? And of course, of course, that's double-edged short because if I can generate of course I can fake things, right? And then I can create things about somebody that don't exist if I want to be malicious, right? But we're not talking about this case now. And there's a whole research about security, right? So is this, uh, I'm gonna show you some video sequences. Is the, are these sequences real or not? That's, a, you know, because there's fake news, right? Uh, you know, because somebody's trying to hurt somebody, et cetera. There's a lot of malicious people, so you need to know about this. But at the same time, we're talking about generation for graphics, for other, you know, good applications for this one. So we'd like to generate multi-view face image from a single. So if I, if I show your face, can I generate different viewpoints of you, even though I've never seen you? But we'll do that by looking at other people. Right? Because everybody is, has a face, the same, except that the statistics of the face is different. 
So for example, if we show at this uh, woman here with this viewpoint, can I generate different viewpoints that look plausible or realistic in a weekend of the difference? And, the, uh, and I'm going to highlight to you, the idea is about these entangled representations in latent space. In the space of the neural net, can I make sure I separate her face from other face so I don't mix them up? Or I learn what it means the viewpoint change across faces. So the idea is this: uh, you heard how many have you heard about uh, adversarial networks? Generally, adversarial network can fake things. You can generate things. Probably haven't. So the idea is this: you have training data. So I saw a lot of pictures, right? The way the neural nets do is they encode your features into this so-called Z space or latent space, and they form parameters in here. And from these parameters, then they generate other pictures. I mean, pictures of you, but a different of this person in different orientations. That's the idea. Okay. The question is. What I want to make sure is that if I input this person, I put, of course, images of this person, right, <laughs> rotated, not somebody else. So, so this space has to be disentangled, as I say. So, if I show, so this is the training. Now, if I see, show you somebody random, that's how it works, right? Then I would like to follow the encoder and the generation, and of course. Um, Hopefully, I'll generate this person at different viewpoints. But as you see, the network, if you don't take, if you don't properly modify the methods here, it's going to create garbage. And you know, networks are notorious for this. And of course, somebody who doesn't have expertise and use as a black box, they won't know what to do. Okay. So the idea is like what we do research in machine learning, we're trying to understand this space. This is the key space where all there is is focusing now in your net. Because you want to disentangle. So th this is superposition of multiple phases. That's why you see it there. Okay? So basically, there's a methodology we have where we're trying to disentangle the, uh, this space so that different people and different features are disassociated. I won't go into the math here, but uh so basically when i when i train of course i can generate reports right but uh when new data come unlabeled i would like to make sure uh they they get uh, disassociated okay so um so basically i would like my network when it sees this person or this person um uh, this is called one shot, not one shot. Uh, it's called one shot view. I show one picture and I generate other uh, viewpoints. Um, so, what should I do in that space to disentangle? So, I don't mix the geometry of the person, of these two people, so that they're not blurry. But what I do is I, I take the, the, the right features of the viewpoint so that it's clear, okay? So let me show you then what happens here. Um, so this is the input, and this is our methods with CRGAN, okay? So let me show you a little bit. Uh, I have a lot more things to show you. Uh, so this is the input, this is, before, so this person now is rotated, okay? So what I do is I train a lot of faces. I take a random face as input. I can generate viewpoints that you've never, I've never seen before. Okay. So you can see it's starting to be a little bit creative, but it's not creative in a true sense of creative. I, I'm very interested in creativity, but creativity means in machine learning terms is that you have two distributions that you don't think they can be put together and some human puts them together, right? So you know something, you know something else, or if you're an artist, right? You've seen the way, the, the state of the art at this point. 
but you see some event triggers you and you take the state of the art and you with this event and you create something else. How do you do that? So mathematically is how do you combine distributions that probably are not distributed, are not combinable, but you create something else influenced by different distributions that's something new. Okay? This is what we're trying to do. That's true creativity. This is not creativity, this is imagination, I would say more. You ima can imagine how this person looks like in this case, right? So these are all different people. I've never seen them and I can generate viewpoints, right? Which are plausible. So this is the idea. And and of course, uh, these are different, uh, you know, the two path here, which is different, but it works very well. Two path means you refine the process of learning. Uh, uh, this is another one, self-supervised, so different methods. So, the, so it's getting the point where you cannot tell the difference. Um, these are other ones. Um, so basically the idea is like you have different people which have a, a, a set of parameters and then some new people, some new, uh, if you want, uh, um, some new images come and then you're trying to find similarities related to the pose, to the looks, and that's why it can do that. So, it, so for example, to get the different viewpoints of this person, it may look, it may get features from all the other people you have seen. That's how it works. But at the same time, knows what it means rotation. So the rotation parameters are also uh, preserved. So this is another example. So you have, so you have the original data, which basically is not enough in this sample, your manifold of parameters of all faces, let's say, and different viewpoints. What you do is you create a generator in parameter space and you inject more data, okay? And then if you can do that, then through a process called encoding and generation, you can reconstruct much better the original manifold. That's the idea, okay? So if you do that, then you can uh, then do this case here. So this is the input. Not only I can generate different viewpoints, but I can change color of hair automatically. So in the old days, these methods were called multilinear PCA, but because people could only deal with linear methods. The problem though, these are non-linear problems. And I've done, I had a lot of papers in the old days with traditional methods, but they were very manual uh, and required also parameters. With these new methods, you know, I'll just give this input and you can create as many pictures as you want of that you've learned of different dimensions with glass, without glass. So look at this. So. You, so you have this input, blonde hair, brown hair, eyeglasses, can change gender, open the mouth, you know. So you can see it's pretty interesting, right? And you cannot tell that this is a fake person. These are generated, okay? So, uh, and then of course you can do user studies. We've done a little bit, but it's not uh, the point because of course you can see. Um, so you see what I'm trying to say is that what the networks do, they learn nonlinear relationships of the face and objects you can put on face like glasses, uh, you know, earrings here. All of a sudden there's earrings, right? So you can do a lot of things. Uh, and that's where things are moving uh, in this direction, right? And the reason is in the old days, if I want to, to generate a face like her, right? Even though I could, let's say I have her, her face uh, without glasses, it takes us so, it was so complicated. You have to do rendering, like the old days, the old pipelines, etc. In the movies, it cost a ton of money. Now with these methods, it's, you just need to run a network. And another thing you should know is that networks are slow to, to learn. In terms of speed, when you run them, it's milliseconds or microseconds. So you can do real-time analysis, right? But as long as you train, 
The difficulty they have is they don't tell you if it doesn't work, why it doesn't work. You know, a notorious problem was the neural nets, uh, not the ones we use, but in the old days, the, 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 the beginnings, I changed one pixel. And from this phase, you could get another one. So just one pixel. So, because that was a key pixel that changed the distribution of the data. Um, another thing that we're doing, and then uh, now switch to the, uh, to the other thing to show you the videos here, is retarget. Well, one is the face, right? Static. What about the expressions? I want to keep the expressions but change the geometry. Or have the face and then generate somebody who's disgusted, happy, etc. Remember, if I can generate, it means I can analyze. Okay? This is what I'm telling you this thing. So I showed you how we can analyze the face and predict action units that psychologists know that way. Psychologists are very excited because now we can verify what they know and go beyond. But at the same time, of course, I can generate things, which is important for movies, important in general to, uh, to show somebody. Look, if I can generate, given a, somebody's uh, hand, let's say they're trying to pitch, you know, uh, in baseball, let's say, right? Well, if I can tell the person, look, if you pitch like this, this is how the ball is going to go. Then you should probably correct it. So you can correct. You can also create what we're doing now in sign language, I'll show you a little bit later. Uh, we can very easily uh, tell if, if someone is trying to learn sign language, what, can you tell me what I'm doing wrong? Remember, it's not only a movement, it's very fast. Well, how do you do that? So I'll show you the beginnings of that. Um, so let me let me show you some pictures here. Some videos, sorry. Uh, so here, can you see my videos? We cannot yes. see them. Can you or no? Uh, no, we can't. So you can, maybe I need to, let me, let me uh, can you share, let me do this. Okay, here. All right. This is, you can see now, right? Yes. Yes. So look here. So you see, this is this uh, person smiling. Look that I transform her smile automatically into different people. So basically, I use the previous method to change the face, but the smile is preserved, right? So happiness, and then this is disgust. So by just looking at somebody, you see, we're trying to go away from somebody dictating this is what this guy is. I want to learn from the data, of course, knowing what this person is discussing, right? So, and this is a big deviation from humans thinking they can parameterize things and where we're terrible. And in the same way, you know, in crime scenes, if it's not within half an hour, it's not valid. So you see things and then you forget it. And if you, somebody asks you, what did you see? Very few people can explain what they see. Same thing scientifically. That's why it's an art to teach well sometimes, <laughs> like next time. Because how do you explain somebody what they are supposed to be seeing, right? So that's the idea here. Let the data, with, of course, if you have domain knowledge, you should put it in, if you can. Let the data, you know, uh, mo model, uh, you know, these complicated moments, which are nonlinear because you see the mouth, you see the nose, it's the wrinkles here in the cheeks, the eyebrows, everything changes. And everybody is different. And this combination, which is a nonlinear combination, how do you learn this? You cannot, you, you, as a human, you cannot. Perfect artists can do that. That's why they usually wish to have a low artist to this thing but they're not perfect either. And they cannot get the statistics from thousands of people. Right? And of course, this is a surprise. Of course, there are five emotions. Um, some people say it's sick, uh, debate. Okay. Um, so uh, let, me, let me also t show you about forecasting. So the idea is this. Um, so we're, We've sampled six different action categories, baseball, clean and jerk, 
golf uh, swing, uh, jump rope, jumping jacks, uh, and tennis respectively, right? So if you see, your, this is the ground truth, okay? The, the top row here. And this is our reconstruction. All I see is the one frame, the, the, the beginning. And you can see it's pretty good. Now, why this blurriness? Because you don't have enough data. The more data you have, the better it gets. But you can see it's pretty good, right? From the beginning, all I have is the beginning. And then they can, so this had made a big splash in computer vision because from one frame, I can generate the whole movement. Okay, which of course very nonlinear. We, we are, you won't believe how complicated we are and why it's so difficult to try uh, and generate. The other one is clean and jerk. So big and ground truth. Ours, these are before us some methods. So like in here, they're much worse. Uh, you see here the blurriness. Uh, as more memory, as the, see the problem with all these methods is big data, right? lots of memory, lots of training with domain knowledge. And, but it's starting to be pretty good. And this is golf swing, which another very difficult type of movement. So this is what we get. This is the original. This is other methods that we don't play. So since then we have a really, really good uh, example of those. And this is jumping rope. So all the, by the way, the network learns all of them at the same time. So it's not like it learns one and then jump rope and then you retrain all. You, you train all these movements, so which is very, very, very impressive. And of course, the way to go. The way you, we as humans, when I tell you, think about somebody jumping the rope, you have in your, and I, you know, a prototype of what it means to jump rope, right? You, 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 you have in your memory the moment. So that's what the network is it's doing in a different way, of course, with different parameterization. Um, one thing that uh, I want to tell you is like parameterization. This is very key. It, the network works in its own space with parameters, of course, thousands of parameters we cannot, well, or we don't know we don't because nobody, none of us, think what's happening in the brain. All we've learned is to learn with symbols, right? We abstract what we happening in our brain and then we can communicate. Maybe the brain uh, has a lot of parameters also. We don't know that yet. Of course, there's a lot of research in brain analytics, but there is an area where I'm working now, but that's very machine learning. It's like, how can I convert the space of the network into human explainable? That's what's uh, happening right now. The other one is jumping jacks. Uh, so this is now more complicated because it's tennis, right? So you rotate. So it's not like you're just doing a movement in front of the camera, uh, which is linear. This is very linear, right? Because it's rotations. So you see this person here, for example, the second column uh, or this column here. So these are very complicated movements, okay? So the, this is, um, these are reference of other people, but this is our method here. This is uh, a paper that was, uh, has made a lot of uh, uh, impact um, because we are able to do non-linear, capture the non areas of the movement. Okay, so let me go, uh, doing new circle. Let me go back to the presentation. Um, this one. Okay, so now you can see my presentation, right? So, um, so um, this is what I showed you now. And uh, what uh, basically the way it does is basically tries to learn by creating possible movements and then improving them. I mean, roughly speaking, it's fairly complicated. I don't want to explain too much more, but so inside in all these methods now, 
there's a generator. So you generate and then you pick what's closest in the end. So, so there's a concurrent video result in the end. So um, basically you see the sequences here and you abstract uh, the movement by generating, by synthesizing movements and then finding what's common between them and then using it to generate. Um, so uh, as it says here, use domain knowledge to guide generation. So we know it's a face, we know it's a human. Um, in that sense, that's what I mean. Uh, a network, you cannot tell it, uh, do this, do this, right? It does what it wants. So, but you, the architecture that you design learns to basically find commonalities or common latent space here between this face and another face. So you see a lot of examples of people smiling uh, and then you try to find what's common about the smile. What's the collection of parameters? And then you create a generator which learns how to generate. Okay, including viewpoint. So that's the idea. Oh, oh okay, so you can see it here as well. Okay, so uh, this guy, so the whole, all the, the input is this uh, person, this woman here, and the rest is all generated. And this is what I was telling you about, our, you know, our method. This is another one by other people. Uh, a year before ours appeared, and this is then, of course, really important. So you can appreciate the nonlinearity of the moment rotations um, only by looking at one picture in the beginning. So the last thing I wanted to talk, and then I will end, is American Sign Language Recognition. As you see, I start my career from Penn, always about behaviors. So I mean, it's a lot of humans. Of course, I do a lot of other research with non-humans, but mostly I do either it's medical, which is humans, or generation or understanding. So uh, now in sign language, I have to, to tell you, I mean, do you, do you know how sign language is uh, done? It's not just the hands, the face too. With the face, they push question marks. It's a multimodal problem, very complicated. So if you say, did John come to the party? The question mark is done with a face called grammatical uh, markers with the face. So you need to look at the face, you need to look at the hands. There's no one to one, it's like the one sign has all the question marks. We can have a question mark across a sentence. So it's a very difficult problem. And it's four dimensional because of course we're three dimensional over time, right? And actually it's more than 4D, it's 5D plus, because you also move, you have the formation of your fingers. You know. um, so the thing is, and I won't explain you the details of the methods, but we have methods we can pick up from the body now and track the arms. Uh, we're working on 3D for the fingers, because fingers are very difficult. We need, you need uh, now the newer level of cameras, which are 60 frames second, and uh, possibly 4K so you can see the details because there's blurring at 30 frames, we move way too fast. Uh, so the cameras at 30 frames and at the time 620 by 480, you get blurring and you don't have the resolution. So with the new cameras, it's not an issue. But I just want to show you like this in this case, right? So what can you do, right? So you see she's moving, right? Do you see, it's, so you have points so you can just show you in slow motion, right? These are the points on the head and the hands, because when you sign, you see how fast they sign, right? At, at least 60 frames a second. A human cannot perceive all the moments. So the way they recognize, look how humans evolve, obviously. It's for humans by humans, right? So you, you, if you want to recognize a sign, if you want to, to follow what she's doing, what you're gonna do is you're gonna learn the configuration of uh, the first hand of the beginning hand shape. The trajectory, you cannot follow the movement of the fingers and they don't. So, the, and then the end, and, and then the end hand configuration. So beginning, trajectory, end. That's how humans can communicate with each other. Otherwise, if you, if you were to try, if, if, if the hand was moving too much, 
between the beginning and the end of the sign, you will never have any chance to understand because you can't perceive the motion, they move too fast. So linguistically, that's what we do. We want to analyze, we use linguistic knowledge. And we were the first to pioneer this in 94 when I was using uh, here the mark of models when I was at Penn at the time. I started and I, start, and I was lucky because I had a student who was deaf and he came to Penn from Germany and he only wanted to do a master's. And he wanted to leave afterwards. And I told him, you know, what do we study in sign language? He wanted to do theory of computer science, which would be a loss, obviously, for him. But he was discouraged. And, and then I, I found him. I didn't know he was there. But anyway, I found him. Somebody told him to talk to me anyway. So And then I started doing the sign language because we're fundamentally for the language. And we did this. At the time, there was no, we couldn't do with vision tracking. So we used the flock of birds of icon systems to track points on the fingers and we're able to recognize. That's how it started, this whole thing. By around 94, 95, I had the first publications. And was the first ever, anyway, to analyze. And since then, of course, we have automated systems, right, as much as possible. We're still developing, man. It's a very difficult problem. Look, look at it again. Uh, I'll show you two, three different people. So you see what she's doing? She's touching, she's doing this. And what's important also in science, the location of your hand will speak the face. It's very important if you start here, if you start here, if you start at your body, if you start your face, if you start away from your body. So you can have similar movements, but depending on the start, mean different things. And you think there's one type of science, there are different types of science. Lexical versus uh, finger spelling versus you name it. It's a full language, as difficult as speech. So you imagine speech we cannot do decipher still. And it's all like one dimensional signal, right? This is 5D plus. There's rotations, translations, deformations, so it's much more complicated. And if you want to see from an evolution point of view, people started first before language. So if you see the brain, the movement, the old brain is the movement. And then you have the new brain where you start thinking all these things and then language develops. And why we develop language? Because sign language means you see each other. With the voice, you don't have to see each other. So it was a revolution, you can speak faster, right? Not that you can express better, but you can speak faster. And I would say also you can abstract, uh, you know, uh, the abstract uh, way of explaining things with the uh, words is probably much better than sign, sign language. Um, or maybe sign language got abandoned unless you have a disability and and uh, is the reason why, uh, you know, we, we have spoken. So it, it, it's an evolution. But if you see little kids, they like to use their hands. Um, so, and th this is the realm of structural movements of the hands, nonverbal behavior, right? Because it's a language. I've also studied uh, when I was at Penn with Aram Kenton and other big names in communication area about gesturing with speech. And now we have a lot of proposals on compa comparing facial, for example, expressions in spoken and sign languages. But also, with Adam Kenton, I, I saw people in Italy. If you see them, you don't have to know what they're saying. Just from the way they gesture, you can tell what they're saying. So it looks like it's in, a, in, every, in each of us. The gesturing is innate because that's how the old people used to do, right? And then we evolved and we developed, of course, spoken language. So gesturing, of course, helps and accommodates speech, even though, of course, you don't need it necessarily. Uh, so the, the two, I just will tell you, there are two different big areas. One is the area of structured, like languages. The other one is unstructured. And what does it mean? And of course, there's normal people, and if you have autistic people, of course, they cannot do any of that. Uh, not only in terms of sign language, but in terms of gesture. So there's differences. So how can you tell the difference? So you, know, you can quantitate this. So what we're doing, uh, let me show you another video, like, uh, uh, like in this case. So you see, he's saying something else, but it's another sign. So you see, the variation is all over the place. Sometimes with signs, you have one hand, you have two-handed, 
which means a dominant, non-dominant, and, and they're both important for the sign. Look, he's using two hands. So you see the problem, right? So the hands come together. So the first step is the torso here. What's happening? So we have the face, and you, you saw the face before. We have the arms. Very soon, I'm going to the student, we're going to have the fingers. But as I said, the fingers, they're most important in the beginning, like here. I mean, so you see, look at here. So he's starting. OK, that's he's putting in position. Uh, he's probably starting. I don't know what it means here. And then he's pointing. You see, all these things matter. You see how it is, and then does that. So you have to have the resolution. I mean, that's the reason why it's hard from these videos. But next time I'll talk to you, I'll show you, of course, fingers, etc. And it has to be in 3D because the 3D is the language is 3D. So you see matters where you are, what you're doing. And there's another one, like in this case, that will show you the variations here. Everybody can sign the same thing with a little bit different. And sometimes a lot different, but humans can understand. So the neural net has to understand, okay? So what we're doing is like, we're developing like a tool where let's say a novice, these are, by the way, Another thing you should know is like in sign language, there's native speakers where both uh, both parents are deaf and therefore the, um, it's hereditary and therefore the kids are deaf, that's called native. If your parents are not deaf, but you're deaf, let's say the mother took something during pregnancy or something happened and, you, you're, and the person is deaf, then it's not native speaker. So it, native speaker means that your parents are deaf and they taught you why since you were born, sign language. Okay, so you have to be careful how you get the data because a lot of people learn. Now, when people learning, they, they use a native speaker in front of them and they sign. So you have a video and you want to say, what went wrong? How do you teach a, a deaf person, right? Uh, you know, in uh, DC, so my, that's, you know, mine is my professor at Calotet, which is a university in, uh, in DC exclusively for deaf people. But how do you teach, right? The way is very difficult. So one way is to give them tools to tell them how well they're doing, right? But the only way you can tell them is not qualitative, you have to quantitate. So if you show them somebody who's native speaker and signs properly, and then they sign and then you can tell the difference, but that can only be done by computer. So this is what I'm saying right now, we have the points here. So we know the movements in 3D and of course the face. And uh, we, we do the analysis of the, of the hand in 2D in the image space. Even though, not, as I said, we're trying to do 3D face. That's where we are right, right now. So just uh, just want to, to stop here, but just want to show you some nice pictures about creativity, right? How the student works at Google Bain. And, uh, we pioneered, so I want to show you, among these pictures, does anybody have a clue which is fake, which is real? These are birds, all generated or not generated some. Who, who can tell me or guess which is a real picture, which is not a real picture? From the, from the beginning, give, tell me, the second from the beginning, third, what, what do you think? Can somebody guess? I can say, uh, what about one and four? One and four. And four. Yes. Real? The real versus, I mean, real pictures, right? That's what you're saying? Yes. Okay. Oh, and let me read some uh, guesses from the audience. Uh, we have one guess, fake, three and four. One three. is fake. <laughs> uh, so which is real, which is fake? So let's say, which is real, which is real? That's the, uh, can someone oh. get Okay, we have someone saying two and five real. Another mm -hmm. one says five is real. Okay. So two and five are real. Two, two. We have another one who says two is real. Two is real and five is real. 
The others are all that was very so what uh, so these are 256 this was the you know since then since now we can do high definition just want to show you how it started and this made a big splash because these were the images this was the state of the art before so this is methods where i was doing the following you see my dream is at some point that i can make a movie from a book so all we're doing in this case, we're reading a sentence. This bird has a yellow belly and tarsus, gray back, wings, and brown throat, uh, nape with a uh, black face. This this was the internet. So from a sentence, I generate pictures. The next step is from a sentence, I can generate movies, because you've seen what we're doing, right? So this is a, a method that jointly learns language, I mean text, with images and learns how to put them together without telling them what is, how to put them together. You give them examples of sentences and pictures and then learns how to, I give them a random sentence as long as it has the vocabulary, of course, it learned and can generate things. So this flower has, I mean, this is generated. This flower has overlapping pink pointed petals surrounding a ring of short yellow filaments. So this, uh, so let me show you. So this is the method anyway. So you do conditional when it's basically you, you, you get the initially the text, you encode it, and then you put the video, okay? And then you learn jointly the space of text and video. In the same way, if I tell you, think of, uh, of a bird flying, you can think of a bird flying, right? It's the same idea. So I learned the joint space of words and, and it learns, you know, the important, the important words from the sentence. So I tell it, look at the bird, you know. What we could do with this method is learn thousand categories. Let me show you, I just want to show you different categories. So these are the different birds, of course. These are method here versus other methods. But uh, the sky's the limit to these things. Uh, uh, anyway, this is like time of picture. I, I have a picture. Let me show you. Uh, just want to end with this one, just to show you that things are getting very interesting here. Um, oh, another thing I want to tell you is like, if I if I if I generate this picture, I want to know is the network really understanding what's background, what's not background, so I can pick a point and then it can learn local areas. It doesn't mix the background. If I put this as background. Then you see it learns this and everything else around. So it learns all this background. So by writing sentences and pictures, somehow with these methods that we have called general decision methods, it learns backgrounds, birds. It learns, for example, the tail here. So you see here the tail. So it learns its, the part. It cannot explain to you. That's why we're moving at methods we're saying now, okay, you generate this. Tell me where is the bird? Where is the where is the where is the tail? Uh, where is the beak, etc. And the other thing where things are moving is like this is why I'm telling you is where revolutionize generation graphics, movies, etc. You can say I want a bird that it says in the in the text, but it learns the ensemble of all the words together. I want to say I want a bird sitting on a branch which is uh, brown. And uh, it's a maple tree as opposed to this tree. You cannot do that. Or I can say, give me a table with a computer on it and a keyboard and things like that. So we can then now start to analyze, which means synthesize or analyze the same thing. So we want, I didn't talk to you about this, but we have a whole idea about, if you look at scenes, you look at movements, can you pick up the important things that, characterize the movement. Attention was one way, there are other ways, okay? So things are moving in that direction. And, you know, these are dogs, etc. So, and these are different generated pictures. Okay, face, we can do a thousand different categories with text. That is the difference. We don't generate random pictures. We have a text, right? You All you do is write a sentence and then generate a, a picture. Okay, so uh, I, I would like to end here and uh,
I think I, I want to try to give you the future. The future is that estimation of movement is not the problem anymore. The problem is analysis, explanation of what's happening. Okay? Is it normal? Is it abnormal? What is it? What part of the movement is the one that's the problematic one? Or causing whatever you're asking, whatever question you're asking. And of course, to generate things the way human would like to generate, which means, as I said, my dream is uh, if I give you a novel, you, you know, mo a lot of movies are based on novels, right? And then you're, excuse me, the director, of course, imagining things that are not in the book, but at least if I had a book, can I, can I make a first movie? And let, let the director use their imagination and change it. But at least you understand. And uh, how we have some, some methods in this direction, but uh, this is one way. There are other ways, uh, you know, to do that. But this is all uh, things are evolving and uh, definitely hot topics for research. And why you see machine learning being so into everything. But if we could understand parts of them and what it is, then we can have autonomy. The reason why we cannot have autonomy, and you know, most people are dropping it now, is because it, the neural net doesn't explain the world. It classifies, it tells you, but it doesn't understand why the representation. And unless you do that, you cannot have, uh, you cannot have, uh, uh, you know, autonomy or explanation. So we're, we're in towards understanding, which true AI as opposed to, in much processing or, you know, more low level, uh, you know, analysis. Okay. Well, thank you very much for the talk. For, for thank you very much, Dimitri. Uh, so I would like to open the Q&A session now.